Hello everyone. Welcome back to this second and final session of our set webinar on monitoring and modeling floods using Earth observations. Today we have a guest speaker, Dr. Augusto Jatirana. Uh, we will introduce him shortly. Just to see what we did last week, uh, we had an overview of flood monitoring and modeling approaches. We also saw a number of examples of flood monitoring and mapping tools based on remote sensing observations. And then we also saw examples of a couple of flood models which are applicable at uh, watershed or small river basin scale. Today we have Dr. Jetirana talking about the Hydrological Modeling and Analysis Platform or HIMAP. HIMAP is a flood routing routine that works with land information system that we talked about last week. So this is going to be the focus of our talk today. We'll start with a brief review of part one. Then we'll launch into a hydrological modeling and analysis platform and its applications. Then we will summarize and we'll have question and answer session at the end. So homework is posted today on our website and answers must be submitted via Google form, right, which is available from our set website. And the due date for homework is October 7, 2022. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend both these live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. Please note that you will receive the certificate about two months after the webinar series is over uh, and you will receive that from Marina Smartings. So just a brief review of what we saw last time. Uh, we looked at flood monitoring tools, specifically MODIS based flood mapping. We looked at the flood observatory um, and which, which provides a river watch or a river discharge information global disaster alert and coordination system, advanced rapid imaging and analysis or ARIA. And we had a presentation from Caroline from NASA Develop about the hydrologic remote sensing analysis of floods, hydro floods. We had an overview of uh, hydrologic models and hydraulic models, what the differences are. The one works with uh, water cycle at a watershed level, the other one works with mechanical behavior of water in open or closed channels. And we saw for flood modeling what NASA Earth observations are useful, such as MODIS, Landsat, Sentinel 1 and 2, they provide land cover, GPM provides precipitation, SRTM provides elevation, and soil moisture. Uh, can be obtained from SMAP. We saw examples of two models, uh, HECRAS and SWOT. And we looked at the website and how to download these um, model softwares. Last week, we mentioned NASA Land Information System or LIS. Um, actually, we talked about a class of models uh, which are based on land surface and hydrologic processes. And they are applicable are not just at watershed or river basin scale, but can be used globally and they can be adapted for different regions. Uh, and LIS is such a model. HIMAP, which is a river routing uh, model uh, that is connected with LIS. And the lead developer for HIMAP is Dr. Jatirana, and he's going to talk about HIMAP model and applications. So just to uh, give you some background about Dr. Jatirana. He is a principal research scientist at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in a Hydrological Sciences Laboratory. His background is in hydrology and civil engineering, and uh, his interests are in applications of state of the art computational models and integration of remote sensing data towards a better understanding of water availability and forecast, including extreme hydrological events such as floods and droughts and climate change impacts on water cycle. 
he has received um, honor awards in 2021 for his uh, research achievements uh, here from NASA and so we invite Dr. Jetirana to talk about HiMap and provide us that information. Thank you. So good, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are attending this meeting, this seminar from. I'm Augusto Gitarana and I'm, I work at, as a research scientist at the Hydrological Science Lab at NASA Goddard. Uh, thank you all for being here today and for your interest in learning more about surface water modeling. Today I'll talk about recent progress on flood modeling at NASA Goddard, from very basic model developments to capacity building. I'd like to start this seminar with the question, why should we care about flood modeling? And before I proceed, I want to note that I'll be using flood, river, and surface water modeling interchangeably. So to answer this question, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Climate change and human activities have been magnifying the occurrence, intensity, and socioeconomic impacts of extreme hydrological events. This is evidenced with the massive number of disasters that occurred globally just this year. Here, I'm showing footage of extreme floods in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Brazil, and in the US just in the past nine months. In the past, the past several decades, NASA has been investing heavily in the development of new technologies to monitor the Earth. And one of the focuses has been the water cycle and its components. This image lists the NASA Earth fleet from past missions launched back in 1995 to future ones expected to be launched in 2027. Some of them, such as Landsat, Terra, Aqua, Jason, Sentinel, and the future SWAT mission have been or will be used to monitor surface water dynamics. NASA's Earth Observatory provides daily images, often highlighting changes in surface waters. Here, I show three examples of these images, one illustrating the shrinking of Lake Powell over the past five years, another one with the magnitude of recent floods in Pakistan, and the third one showing the shrinking of Great Salt Lake. Satellite data has, a clear, has clear advantages, such as allowing us to monitor remote regions, its global spatial distribution, the free and unrestricted access, at least to data acquired by NASA. And, and there, but there are several other advantages as well. On the other hand, satellite data also has some disadvantages. For example, the temporal resolution of most satellite data varies from several days to a month or course in some cases. This prevents us from monitoring fast events as flash floods. And we are still not capable of observing key uh, physical processes such as groundwater dynamics and absolute surface water availability. Time series are relatively short. Uh, most data sets are available starting in early 2000. And we are still limited to monitor only past events. By integrating satellite data with computational models through model evaluation, calibration, and data simulation techniques, we can um, obtain estimates of under-observed physical processes, uh, refine spatial and temporal resolutions, look at historical events, and build what-if scenarios, and predict the future through forecast and climate projections. So this is where the importance of flood models is and why you should care about them. Flood models can also be used to improve boundary condition of atmosphere, atmospheric models and to provide uh, estimates of the special temporal distribution of water for engineering projects, water management, and use. River models are mainly characterized by their spatial and temporal scales, going from the meter to several kilometer scale, and from seconds to monthly time steps. By discretization, for, for example, they can be grid-based or vector-based, by complexity of physical processes from simple mass transfer equations to full hydrodynamic equations. Physical processes can also include human activities such as reservoir operation, water management, and pumping for irrigation. And a non comprehensive list of river models are listed on the left side. On the right side, I show two examples of discretization. On the top is uh, the MGB model over the Negro River Basin in the Amazon, uh, where the model is based on vectors discretized by catchments. And in the bottom, high map is discretized in grid cells over the Nile Basin. The far right image shows the impact of Lake Nasser operation 
from the comparison of two what if scenarios representing the system without and with uh, res of operation. At the Hydrological Science Lab at NASA Goddard, we developed the Land Information System, or LIS, which is a modeling framework composed of numerous land surface and hydrological models, data simulation capabilities, and is adapted to ingest a wide range of remote sensing data sets. Among the models available in LIS, we have the HiMap Global River Model. HiMap stands for Hydrological Modeling and Analysis Platform. HiMap is coupled with a wide range of land surface models. Basically, HiMap routes the total runoff simulated by uh, the LSM, or land surface model, through a prescribed river network. And the outputs are stream flow, water depth, and storage in both rivers and floodplains, as well as, as uh, flood velocity, floodplain extent, among other variables. Since HiMap was first implemented in LIS uh, 11 years ago, numerous capabilities have been added over time. Today, uh, you can, for example, simulate stream flow observations and satellite-based water levels and extent. You can also simulate urban hydrology, coastal interface, reservoir operation, and water management. You can also perform forecasts and run the model in a two-way coupling configuration, meaning that the high map informs the land surface model with surface water extent and uh, availability, and that will be added to the vertical water balance of the, the LSM, impacting the computation of infiltration, soil moisture, and evapotranspiration. Uh, I'm currently working on the implementation of a bifurcation capability that is particularly important over river deltas. And there's future plans to in introduce a, a lake module, water quality capabilities, and a coupling with irrigation models. I also wanted to highlight that HiMap is, is global and has a flexible spatial scale, going from like one degree spatial resolution to 200 meters or finer, depending on the input parameters. Given this introduction, uh, I will present four HiMap applications using different capabilities. First, I'll present a, a HiMap application where the goal was to determine the impacts of surface waters on the global terrestrial water storage variability. Then I will show uh, a study where HiMap is used to quantify climate and human impacts on hydrological processes and flood risk in southern Louisiana. I will also present the implementation of a reservoir operation scheme and its evaluation over Lake Victoria in eastern Africa. And the fourth application is an ongoing cap capacity building project where the goal is to transfer an urban flood model to operations in the city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Finally, I'll give my final considerations and prospects. So let's go to the first case. So this is a study that was published in Geophysical Research Letters in 2017, and the scientific questions that we, we tried to answer were, what is the global impact of surface water storage on terrestrial water storage, or TWS, and how does that impact vary spatially? First, to answer that, the, these questions, we designed a methodology based on the coupling of high map with the NOAA MP land surface model to simulate inland water fluxes and storage components globally. NOAA MP provides vertical water fluxes and storage in the groundwater, soil moisture, snow, and three canopy. Uh, and HiMap provides liquid water storage on the land surface. Meteorological forcing uncertainty was accounted for by performing runs with multiple data sets. Basically, we combined four meteorological forcings. MERA2, GDAS, Princeton, and ECMWF with two precipitation data sets, stream and stream real time, resulting in 12, in 12 simulations. And we used the ensemble mean as a reference for our evaluation. This is the resulting surface water storage variability. We found that about uh, 2,900 cubic kilometers of water is stored in rivers and floodplains. And about 28% of that water, or 800 uh, cubic kilometers, is concentrated only in the Amazon Basin. Uncertainty, uncertainty due to the meteorological force is about 6% globally. Uh, and these are the, the, the three other main water storage components, soil moisture, snow water equivalent, and groundwater. And combining the four of them, we have the global terrestrial water storage variability. Using the spatially and temporally distributed water storage components that I just showed, 
we were able to compute individual spatially distributed impacts of each component of TWS. Surface water storage impacts are 8% globally with large spatial variability. Impacts are uh, high in the tropics, but also over major rivers flowing in high latitudes and dry regions such as the Nile River. Groundwater has a global impact of 17%. Snow impacts are observed exclusively in the high latitudes with a global average of 23%. Soil moisture con controls most of TWS variability with a global average of 51%. And these are climatologies of these four water storage components averaged over selected river basins. And the percentuals represent their corresponding impacts on TWS within each river basin. We can see, for example, that uh, surface water storage contributes 20% to TWS variability over the Amazon Basin on the left and 22% over the Nile Basin. Uh, that number drops to 7% over the Mississippi Basin in the US and 10% uh, over the Lena Basin in Russia. It is important to know that uh, these numbers could change if, if different, a different combination of models with different physics were used. Also, uh, uh, human activities were neglected and that certainly impacts the water storage locally and regionally. So there's definitely room for future work here. So let's move on to, uh, now to Southern Louisiana. This study was developed in the framework of a new NASA initiative called Earth Information System, or EIS. In the framework of the EIS pilot, we focus on developing tools and showing the full power of NASA to answer critical questions about the Earth system. Uh, one of the science questions under EIS is related to how climate and human activities impact floods in vulnerable coastal areas. So we chose Southern Louisiana as our first study case for being a region highly impacted by climate change and human activities. Based on satellite and ground-based observations, we can characterize major changes occurring uh, in that part of the planet. Streamflow data in the top right figure uh, shows evidence of climate-induced hydrological change with more frequent flood peaks in the past, in the, the more recent years. Next, we have annual sea levels uh, since 1983 derived from radar altimeter data with a steeper positive trend observed in the past 20 years. Terrestrial water storage over land has also been increasing the past 20 years, uh, showing the, the figure from the, the third figure from the top. And finally, uh, all that happens while the coasts have been experiencing significant land loss in the past decades. The idea here was to develop a modeling system that allows us to isolate factors that we identify as drivers for these changes. And three main factors have been identified, sea level rise, climate-induced hydrological change, and water management. So in order to represent these factors, I implemented two new capabilities in HiMap. One was a water management module, and another was a coastal interface module using sea levels as a proxy to represent ocean dynamics. The model was built using data from multiple sources, including USGS streamflow data as upstream boundary conditions, uh, in situ based river channels geometry, also from USGS, and US Army Corps of Engineers data to represent three major flood control structures in the Mississippi River. The old river control, control structure, uh, Morganza floodway, and Bonacare spillway. The locations are indicated in the bottom left map. We define four scenarios with different combinations of these factors. Scenario one is where all factors are combined. Scenario two represents a case without water management. Scenario three represents a case without water management or sea level rise. A sea level, a sea level climatology is used instead. And finally, Scenario 4 represents a case without water management and no sea level variability at all. Simulations were performed for the period from 1993 to 2020 at 2 kilometers spatial resolution. It is important to note that the representation of sea level impact on floods is only possible because HiMap uses the local inertia formulation, which is an approximation of the saint venin hydrodynamic equations that allows us to represent backwater effects. Using scenario one as the best representation of reality, we notice that the model shows an increase of both flooded area 
and surface water storage from 1983 to 2020. This is consistent with the satellite observations that I showed earlier. The maps on the left show the changes in flooded area and surface water elevation, and the figures on the right show the time series of flooded areas and surface water storage since 1993. Looking at the top right figure, for example, we can see that the model outputs indicate that flooded areas have increased about 76 square kilometers per year since 2002. And we can determine the isolated impact of factors by subtracting one scenario from another. And by doing so, we end up with uh, the three maps on the left, representing changes in the annual flooded areas from an early period, defined by the, five, the, the first five years of the simulation, to a late period, defined by the last five years of the simulation. We can see that uh, CHC, or climate-induced hydrological change, had a significant impact on the annual flooded areas over that period. There's a major increase in flooded areas on the western side of the domain uh, due to an increased precipitation over those smaller catchments, and a decrease in flooded areas in the central part of the domain due to reduced annual stream flow in the Atchafalaya River. But the balance is positive, uh, in, uh, with a total increase of about 1,500 square kilometers. Uh, the isolated impact of sea level rise, or SLR, is not as significant as that caused by hydrological changes, uh, with an increase of about uh, 400 square kilometers. That increase is mostly observed near the Mississippi River Delta on the, south, uh, the southeastern side of the domain. Finally, by isolating water management impacts, we see a clear decrease in flooded areas along the Mississippi River and increase in the Atchafalaya River. And this results in an overall drop in flooded areas of about 600 square kilometers. We also overlap these maps with cropland and population maps, and the results are in the, the bar plots. This means that the population and cropland were used as, as proxies to determine the socioeconomic impacts from floods. Here, we quantify, uh, we quantify how changes in flood intensity from the early to the late periods has impacted cropland and population. Use the median and annual events as a, as a reference. What is clear here is that uh, sea level rise shows lower uh, socioeconomic impacts than uh, climate-induced hydrological change, and that water management substantially reduces that impact, particularly from annual flood events. This was a padded study, and uh, of course, there's a number of limitations in the representation of the actual physical processes. Uh, but th this approach can be refined by introducing other factors such as land subsidence, tides, and storm surges. Also, there's, also there's more, um, more and more vulnerable coastal zones around the world that would benefit from this modeling system. Uh, actually, uh, the EIS follow one taking place right now uh, focuses on the Gantz and Putra Delta, mostly Bangladesh, where a lot of the same issues take place. And we've been working with the local authorities and academics to customize the new system. So now let's uh, take a look at how dam operation impacts the, the dynamics of Lake Victoria in Eastern Africa. This study was published in Science of the Total Environment in 2020, and there were two objectives. The first one was to propose and implement a satellite-based reservoir operation scheme in HIMAP. And the second one was to evaluate the, the impact of such, such a scheme on the representation of physical processes of the lake. This image shows the three gorges dam and its representation in, uh, in its reservoir and floodplains. A hydrological model, however, if not informed with human activities, represents, represents a system like this, as we can see now. And this is what I define as a naturalized system which is the absence of any anthropogenic activities, no impoundment uh, represented. The figure also illustrates the longitudinal profile of a river ridge within a grid cell of a model where QI and HI are the inflow and upstream water elevation, QO and HO are the outflow and downstream elevation, and S is the river water storage. On the other hand, 
with the use of satellite data, we can inform models on water elevation dynamics of the reservoir as a proxy of its operation practices. Based on radar, uh, radar altimeter data, for example, we can determine the additional water storage that the model would need to reach the observed uh, elevation. So at the end of each computational time step, the model takes the following rules. If the difference between the simulated outflow and a given minimum stream flow is equal or higher than the differential water storage, then the elevation matches the observations in the downstream water elevation out and, and outflow are updated accordingly. If not, the, uh, as I show here, the downstream water elevation is updated with the maximum value that the available outflow can provide. As I mentioned before, the study area is Lake Victoria. The bonus on the right lists several features of the lake. What we have to know here about the Lake Victoria is that it's a natural lake but controlled by a dam since 1954, the Nalu Bali Dam. Data used to represent the lake in the model was derived from the Merit Hydro Database, the lake bathymetry from in situ data, and radar altimeter data acquired from the Hydro Web Database. The two figures on the bottom right show the three dimensional lake bathymetry, satellite track used in the model, and a transactional profile of the lake. Once again, uh, experiments were based on the coupling of high map with the known P lane surface model, but this time at 10 kilometers spatial resolution. And two experiments were conducted. One representing the naturalized system and another one representing the reservoir operation. Uh, these experiments were repeated uh, with four meteorological uh, data sets, MERA2, MERA2 with CHIRPS precipitation, ECMWF and GDAS. So these are the results for the lake water elevation. Radar altimetry is uh, represented with circles and simulation uh, from the reservoir operation experiments are represented with the red lines. The dark red represents the median of the four runs with different meteorological forcings. Results show that all forcings present good metrics for water elevation. Here, RMSC stands for root mean square error, then we have natural cliff coefficient or NS, correlation or R, and the standard deviation uh, ratio or gamma. Uh, GDAS shows the best overall result, but we can see that some met methodological forcing show issues filling the lake, in particular ECMWF. Uh, there's about seven meter difference between experiments with reservoir operation and the naturalized system. We can also see that GDAS has too much water and ECMWF uh, has too little. All metrics are significantly improved with the reservoir operation scheme, and metrics here uh, in blue are for naturalized system and in red for the reservoir operation experiment. We also looked at lake water extent variability. On the left side, I show water extent time series from both naturalized and reservoir operation experiments. Again, light colors represent each individual meteorological forcing run and dark colors represent their medians. The metrics are the long-term mean water extent values, a standard deviation of each time series and their trends in square kilometers per year. In the top right, I show animations of flood refraction from the naturalized system, reservoir operation, and the difference between them. So looking back to the time series on the, on the left, now I added the water extent estimates from MODIS and, and Landsat. Long-term average model water extents match satellite observations, as we can see. Res operation and Landsat based variability uh, are similar, except for MODIS. Uh, all trends are positive, but uh, both model experiments show steeper trends. Uh, these scatter plots show the correlation between water extent derived from model runs and satellite observations, and water levels uh, derived from radar altimetry. And we can see that water extent derived from reservoir operation shows the best agreement. 
Uh, we're moving now towards the last high map application, which is a mix of model development, applied sciences, and capacity building. Uh, this work has been developed in the framework of a, of a pioneer partnership between NASA and a city. The NASA Rio partnership was initiated about seven years ago with the overall goal of applying NASA Earth observations to monitor, understand, and anticipate environmental hazards at the urban scale. We've been pursuing this goal by conducting joint activities that leverage not only NASA products, but also local monitoring and crisis management capa uh, capabilities. In initially, this partnership included hazards such as heavy rainfall, sea level rise, and landslides. Uh, however, about three years ago, we started discussing the possibility of monitoring floods as well, taking advantage of NASA Goddard's unique modeling capabilities. The goal of this effort is to transfer a customized flood monitoring system to local operations. And the proposed plan to achieve that goal is to combine NASA tools, models, and data sets, local expertise in monitoring capabilities, and capacity building. The main challenge here was to represent fine resolution urban processes currently missing in global river models. And that challenge required the development of, of an urban drainage uh, module in HiMap. Basically, this module represents streets rather than rivers, and it also represents the water exchange between the, between the street surface and ground, uh, underground drainage pipes, as well as water storage and flow within the drainage system. That representation is based on a series of parameters listed in the table on the right. And since I didn't have access to an urban drainage map, these parameters had to be estimated based on our best knowledge. The urban drainage map uh, in the top center of the slide had to be created through the acquisition and processing of local and satellite-based high-resolution information. And the result urban flood model covers uh, a domain including the city and catchments of all rivers flowing through the, through the city at a 200 meter spatial resolution. So here are some results of a flood uh, event that occurred in April 2010. The top left animation shows hourly precipitation fields, and the bottom left animation sh shows water depth anomalies using the first time step of the event as the baseline. Uh, these preliminary results give us an idea of the magnitude of floods across the city and how they relate to precipitation. And in order to extract more information from these model outputs, I developed a post-process downscaling algorithm that converts these maps from 200 to 10 meters which is the DEM spatial resolution. The result is the animation on the right, showing the same event at the street scale. Because of limited data availability, we won't be able to validate the model against observations, because when there's this uh, flash floods, uh, the, the sky is covered with clouds. Uh, so the idea is to improve the interpretation of uh, model outputs uh, as future events are simulated in near real time. This means that as a, a future event, uh, as future events are simulated, they and the municipality will compare model outputs against the actual severity of floods occurred across the city, then identify where the model systematically over or underestimates floods. The development of this system is at a, an advantage stage, and we have all the routines lined up and ready for transfer to operations in the local server. But due to a recent cyber attack to the municipality system, including its servers, the process is in standby until they recover the losses. It is important to highlight that the, the lessons learned from this effort can be expanded to new global partnerships, benefiting cities suffering from similar hazards. You're moving now towards the end. Uh, let's, take, let's talk about the final considerations and prospects. So since HiMap was first implemented in at least back in uh, 2011, there's been significant improvements in the representation of physical processes. The combination of all capabilities currently available in HiMap puts it as, a, as one of the most advantaged global flood models available. And that's particularly true when we include all unique capabilities found in LIS that can be used in conjunction with HiMap to simulate the global water cycle. Other capabilities that are not exemplified here, such as forecasts and two-way coupling, can be found in papers 
they are published in the the past. They were published in the past two years. Of course, that there is uh, always something else to be improved. So I'm constantly developing new features in in the model. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm finalizing the implementation of a bifurcation scheme, and uh, res operation also needs attention. My idea is to implement an approach that doesn't require observations to be used as an input in the model, so it can be easily expanded globally, with uh, even in locations where we don't have any data. Uh, HiMap is freely available in Liz, and uh, anyone interested in, uh, can download the model uh, using the GitHub link. Uh, many of you uh, are probably familiar with the uh, lane data simulation systems such as GLDAS, FLDAS, uh, NLDAS, and NCLDAS. All these systems are based on LIS, and there's been an effort for them to incorporate surface water dynamic variables simulated with HiMap. I know that you can find a HiMap output from uh, FLDAS and NCLDAS, but I'm currently working uh, with G uh, GLDAS developers to make HiMap outputs available in the system as well. I also have collaborations in different parts of the world with uh, where HiMap is, is being used. These collaborations are in South America, Europe, uh, Western Africa, Southern Asia, and Australia, but new collaborations are always uh, welcome. So please give it a try and let me know if you have any ideas for new developments or applications. Uh, so, and with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude this seminar. So thank you for your participation and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augusto, for that very informative and detailed presentation about HiMap and its applications. So this concludes our webinar series for flood monitoring and modeling. And before we uh, go to the question and answer session, let's just briefly look at some of the tools that we covered in this webinar series. Uh, we started with flood monitoring and mapping tools. So MODIS flood map, uh, it's available from NASA Worldview. Um, we saw Pakistan flood uh, based on MODIS, and that is basically optical data um, is used to detect uh, surface where there is water. Uh, then we talked about the flood observatory, uh, river discharge, scheme which provides river discharge based on passive micro observations from satellites. We visited or looked at ARIA which is uh, using Sentinel-1 SAR observations to provide flood mapping. Uh, so there are flood events covered by ARIA and then we also looked at GDAX which has um, multiple data sources and it's used mostly for disaster management so all these websites are here for your uh, for information um, also note that modis flood map is the one that provides uh, near real time flood information all others have some latency then we talked about uh, Hydra floods. Uh, we had um, a case study um, in Central America where Hydra floods was used to monitor uh, extreme flooding. Um, it's based on multiple satellites, it's publicly available, and it's based on the Google Earth Engine and uh, cloud, Google Cloud Platform. Also has a Python API. Uh, Hydra flood scope code can be downloaded and installed on your computer. It can be run for flood monitoring. We saw that um, last week. Uh, we saw example of HECARAS and SWOT models. Uh, we looked at the website. The addresses are given here where you can download uh, code and install on your computer and has a lot of information and tutorial on both these sites. So we had a brief overview of that. And today uh, uh, we had information about um, LIS HiMap. Also, we saw from Dr. Jatirana that uh, HiMap is freely available in LIS through GitHub. And here are the links where uh, it can be downloaded. So uh, this concludes our webinar uh, series and we will go to question and answer session next. 
So please type your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them in the order that they are received. The Q&A uh, will be posted on the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Hello, yes, let's go to the uh, question and answer. And we also have Dr. Chaitanya here. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm going to read the questions and um, see how many we can address now. Um, if we cannot go get through all of them, we will add answers here and this will be posted on the website. So first question is, if there is a lack of data available for instance, if all the small tributaries in a region are not mapped or we do not have information of those that are not available in our model, how can we account for that and perform flood modeling? Uh, can you hear me? Y yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so the, the, it, I don't know what you mean by um, the lack of data available if it's uh, you're talking about uh, stream flow observations because in terms of um, uh, model inputs uh, that all comes from uh, you know global data sets that we have these days like the topography or just empirical equations to uh, determine the river geometry so those tributaries will be accounted for in, in any way uh, but uh, you may you may not have, I mean, you, if you don't have access to stream flow observations, then you don't know how accurate those uh, simulations are at those locations. But uh, the the short answer to your question, uh, they are accounted for. Thank you. So second question is, what inputs are required in HECRA software for flood modeling? Okay, so um, uh, if you look at the inputs, the weather data, terrain data, channel, um, hydraulic information, these are all required by HECRAS. Um, so if you go to their website, there is a whole section on what input data uh, you need. But the basic data are weather data, terrain data, channel uh, hydraulic information, they're all needed. Also, um, uh, the level of water, water depth at certain locations they're needed, especially the most downstream. Uh, if you go through the inputs, they were listed on the presentation slide. Question three is, is sea level rise measured by anomalies in the coastline during a measurement period or how can we measure it through observation with satellite measurements? Uh, they are measured uh, as a absolute elevation from uh, radar altimeters using a vertical datum as a reference. So that, that would depend on the, the product that you'll be using. But uh, they uh, some, some products will also be available as anomalies. Yes. And uh, sea level, uh, so uh, we can share a website with you later also where um, satellite observations are used to look at uh, sea level anomalies. Um, question four is, can machine learning be used to answer some of these questions, um, such as drivers of truck risk? If so, could you give some examples? Uh, I'm not... Uh working on any projects using machine learning uh, for flood risk, but uh, I know that uh, they, uh, some people have been using that. I mean, I can't give you any details on that, unfortunately. Yes, I, I think it's possible, but I'm not sure whether it's operationally used yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay, question five is, could you explain more about CHC and SLR factors and how um, how you implement them in your model? So uh, CHC, the climate induced hydrological change, is um, is basically identified in the meteorological forcing. So it's not like they're adding that uh, in, 
in the model. Uh, so like in some locations, you find that the, the hydrological change, others you won't find. But uh, so that, that's basically, uh, uh, you have to first, uh, you know, analyze the, your, your, the, the available data set and see if there's any changes in the hydrology. So that's not added, that's, uh, that's included in the, that's observed in the methodological portions. Uh, for the sea level rise, the same thing. So you're, I mean, it's it's known that uh, sea levels are going up uh, on average globally. So in the case of um, uh, the Mississippi Delta, there's a, a like a, 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 a substantial increase. Uh, in, there's some locations that the, the increase is, is minimal or even negative, but uh, that's the exception. So these two things are not, so they are included as uh, observations that you used uh, to force the model. Great, so the next question is, is it possible to share your model to replicate our study area? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the model is available on GitHub. And then there's a, a pre-processing, a, a data uh, processing step that's required to prepare the, the input files that Liz needs to, to be run over your uh, study area. Uh, I mean, I can, if you get in touch with me by email, I can help you with the, the, the setup. So I'm not sure whether you can see my screen or not, but that has the link that Dr. Chaturana shared, that is the GitHub page where you can go and download data. This is the page. Um, and Augusto, you can walk through this and I can navigate. Yeah, so like if you go up, uh, so just go to the, the, the green box code. And then you download the the, the the zip file like on the bottom. I mean, the different ways uh, to, mm -hmm. to access the, the the access list. And then there's the. I mean, you, then once you have list in your, it has to be a Linux machine. Uh, you need a, a like a. You have to follow the the user guidelines where there'll be there's a, a number of uh, libraries that you have to. Have installed in the in the in your Linux environment, and then you can co compile this. I mean, it's, a, it's also a process. You have a whole team uh, that uh, supports users when you have any issues in uh, compiling the list. Uh, actually, it's uh, it's through that same page. Uh, let's see. There's somewhere where you can post your questions or discussions. Like if you go to the top, there's a horizontal bar. If you move up, go up. Just go to the top of the page. Just scroll up. Okay, yeah. yeah here. Questions. Here. Yeah. And then you can post your questions and uh, if you have any issues in the uh, list compilation. It's not. Okay, so that's great. There is uh, help available. So you can download the model here. It has yeah, to be. The... Yeah, you have to follow the, I think in docs, there's a, if you go to the docs uh, directory, there's a user guideline. Here. Yeah. Yeah, so there is users. Yeah. And then you have to follow the, see what, uh, what libraries are required uh, in the, your Linux environment uh, before you can proceed with the list compilation. Okay, sounds good. And then so. Yeah, all, so there's a, all the, the guide, guides are there uh, for the installation. But I mean, as I said, there's also the, we are like, I don't know, about 30 people working uh, on these. So we are always answering questions of different users uh, in different places in the world. So that's wonderful. I think the 
um, this you can download this and use for your own region. Mm -hmm. uh, question seven is: Can high map modeling provide solutions that can support flood water harvesting for irrigation or farmlands? Uh, so, all right. I think for, for we get you, you need a more comprehensive modeling framework if you want to have uh, if you want to provide solutions for irrigation. For example, you also need groundwater information, right? If you're if you're pumping water, pumping groundwater to supply your your irrigation practices and soil moisture. So you need a more comprehensive modeling framework using a land surface model. Uh, you can the high map will, will be useful to provide you with um, a surface water availability, the spatial temporal availability of water in, in, in rivers and floodplains. But uh, I believe that for irrigation, you need more information than that. And I mean, <laughs> But uh, based on uh, what I can see here, so if high map modeling can uh, provide solutions, I mean, so the sol they can provide you uh, additional information, right? Like what uh, information on the, the water availability. But the solution, it's a uh, the user will come up with a solution based on information that high map provides. Okay, so question eight is. How is the existing infrastructure like underground constructed stormwater drains handled in high map? Urban flood modeling requires high resolution DEM like LIDAR, uh, reformed uh, on uh, urban elevation and time scale like 15 minutes rainfall. How does high map handle data issues? So uh, yeah, I, I went, uh, I tried to be um, very, like I uh, summarized the that application, but uh, we have LIDAR data from the municipality at the centimeter scale. Uh, so in, in that that product is divided into two, like the, the bare soil elevation and the built, the, the built uh, DEM, I mean, not DEM, but uh, the, the elevation. So based on that, we can, we're able to identify where there's a street, where there's a building, where there's a house, and, and then we upscaled that information to 10 meters. And then from 10 meters to 200 meters, that's the, the model of spatial resolution. So yeah, uh, for urban flood modeling, you do need uh, a LIDAR DEM. And also in time scale like the 15. Yeah, and then I mean, in addition to that, you need like a, a fine temporal resolution precipitation so you can detect flash floods. So the city also has a, a monitoring, uh, a real time uh, rainfall monitoring system. That So they have uh, precipitation measurements at 33 locations within the city every five minutes. So that's the kind of uh, structure that you need or like if you if you wanna if you wanna think about you know a, a flood monitor flood, uh, monitoring system, you need that kind of infrastructure uh, installed in the city because at, at the end of the day, the the model output will be as good as the inputs they provide. Right. right. So question nine is, is there any validation using the urban flood models like SWMM with the high map urban model? I don't know what the SWMM is. Uh, yeah, me, I don't know either. So perhaps you can clarify uh, and yeah, we will look into that. What's SWMM? Mm -hmm. Uh, question 10 is, could public reporting during flooding events assist in model validation at city scales, given that imagery data is limited during weather events? Are there examples? Yeah, actually, there, there was a, uh, within the project with, with Rio, so the, the civil defense uh, had, had, they have these, um, uh, these 
community in Rio where they, they, there's a constant flood. So the, what, they are, what they are doing uh, in order to replace the lack of uh, observations to, to validate the, uh, the model, we are using crowdsourcing data. So basically, like on YouTube or Twitter, people in the community was, would post like, look, it's, it's flooding again. Like one more time, so they take pictures and they, they, they post that on Facebook. So we are getting those posts and to uh, the, identify the days when uh, the, 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 the community was flooded. So we could compare that with the model, see if the model was also, I mean, of course, it's, a, it's not as an accurate, accurate uh, way to validate a model, but uh, it's what we have available. So we are using crowdsourcing. Yeah, also to add to that, uh, GDAX also has a system in place uh, that once a disaster is declared, uh, they have uh, in-country or in-place uh, organizations they can get information from, um, which is not just satellite-based, but ground-based and you know, other, other information. So that's possible. Um, what, kind of, what kind of a disaster do they collect data from? Because, uh, so, is that Floods are also like I know that uh, I know about landslides, but not sure about floods. Yeah, and they have floods, they have storms, they have earthquakes and landslides. So GDAX has multiple um, disasters they work with. But I believe that those uh, those data for larger scales, not for like the you know the, the neighborhood scale within a city, right? Yes. I don't think it's neighborhood scale, uh, but I think uh, uh, whatever area is affected by disasters. Whatever information they can get and verify, they I think post it or make it available in the reports. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, question eleven is: What parameters are needed to use HiMap for urban flood forecasting? Well, forecasting. Uh, I mean, what I what I showed uh, in the seminar was important. Was just monitoring the like queue. You, so you're going up to near real time. So basically, modeling the past. Uh, for forecasting, you're looking at the future, right? So first thing you need a, you know, mythological like, well, forecasts, but that's not a parameter. That's a that's a forcing. Uh, the parameters will be the same uh, for either forecast or historical runs. So you need, as I, as I mentioned before, you would need uh, a lidar-based DEM. Uh, so uh, actually, I mentioned that in the, one of the slides, the, the, the information that you need. So you also need, you know, like soil, like land, land cover uh, and land use map. So you know where the, there's an urban area where there's, there isn't. I, ideally, you need, a, you know, the, the drainage, uh, a map with a drainage system. In, in the case of Rio, I didn't have access to that. So we just had to, you know, be creative. Um, so in the, also there's a, there's a list of parameters that were, uh, you know, guessed. Uh, for example, the where there's a, a, a you know all the, the drainage, the urban drainage system, all those all that information is required. But uh, in the in the, the absence of uh, in situ observations, uh, in situ data, we have to just make good guesses. Um, yeah, and, and, and if you have a river network, like for example, a, a lot of cities in the case of uh, Rio, uh, uh, several natural rivers were, uh, you know, canalized. They became basically, uh, you know, like canals instead. Some of them are even covered. Yeah, so that's basically. Mm -hmm. Great. So question 12 is, how can we perform flood monitoring in glacial areas such as in the Himalayas, Andes, or Alps? Uh, um, that, that, there's, a, uh, there's a project for high mountain Asia where they are also simulating um, stream flow over that domain. So, I mean, that, it would be the same the same case, it's just uh, as long as you have the data, the, the, the parameters, you can uh, run the model anywhere in the world. But um, I think in that case, I think the, the concern of the person who asked the question is about the 
uh, like glacier melting, and that that will be an issue related to the land surface model they're using. So high map will the high maps job will be to get the total runoff from the land surface model and route through a river network. So if there's no glacier represented in the in the model, so I mean that will be a limitation. But that's not on the high map side. That's uh, on the land surface model side. So you may have to make sure that you have the, the appropriate land model. You know, the, 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 the the appropriate physics for the domain that you're looking at. Uh, so, um, Augusto, I just was wondering, does LIS have uh, glacial representation? or? Yeah, there's someone working on that. Uh, so it's being implemented. There's a Crocus is a is a French uh, mo glacier model, and that that's been implemented. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, question thirteen is: I was wondering how to deal with imbalanced data sets in flood data set. My current project has around uh, thirty percent flood pixels and seventy percent non flood pixels. What are the standard methods for dealing with these? Thank you. Wait, the, the, the question is clear. I was wondering. Uh, so um, I'm not sure what the question means, but um, imbalance data sets in flood data sets. Um, I don't know what the. Yes, yeah. I, I think the question is not very clear. If you can reframe it, uh, is this from flood model? When you mentioned pixels, are these grids you're talking about, or is this satellites, or you know, it's, it, it needs a little clarification. Question 14 is, what is the maximum spatial extent of the region of interest that high map can use reliably? Such as urban five by five kilometers or watershed 30 by 30 kilometers? Uh, I mean, the high map can be run globally, so there's no, such a um, there's no maximum. I mean, the maximum is mobile. But uh, then, like, if you if the 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 larger the domain is and the finer resolution you're using, then you should expect you no know, longer and longer uh, simulations. So there's no real uh, limitation. It's just that it just take longer for you to run the your your simulations. So question 15 is, has this method been used for real-time flood forecasting purposes and where? Yes. Uh, so there's a, there was a project, uh, Servier, a NASA Servier project where, over West Africa that um, the goal was to develop this uh, flood forecast system. And um, so basically we were simulating raise data into the land surface model in order to improve the uh, uh, forecast initial conditions. So there, there's this case in, the, in West Africa. There's another case uh, uh, over the whole Africa. It was another NASA applied sciences uh, project. And there's a third one that's funded by uh, the US Air Force. Yeah globally and that 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 probably should be available at some point i don't know like maybe next year so yeah there are a few there are a few examples for uh for uh flood forecasting question 16 is what is the difference between a deterministic and probabilistic model for insurance and reinsurance which model is required Uh, I mean, we don't talk about this here. At the Terminix models, I mean, you, you're using, you, it's basically based on uh, physical processes, right? While probabilistic, you're just using a, a, a historical data and based on uh, probability. Yeah, based yeah. on statistical methods, you, you define what's the, uh, what the the future like the forecasts will be 
but for insurance and reinsurance, <laughs> that's not my, my field. Yes, I think uh, a lot of a lot of um, insurance and reinsurance uh, for that uh, statistical methods are used. Uh, that is true. Uh, I don't know whether that's uh, that is required. That is better, but uh, yes, it is. I think easier to use based on past data. So. Mm -hmm. Question 17 is in the usage of high map and the supply of satellite of height for Q estimation, what do you suggest for small rivers where altimetry is not possible? Um, I mean, if there's no observations, then there isn't. Uh, there are other ways to, I mean, you, you should look for in serial data, if there's no in serial data, then the satellite red altimetry is an option, as you uh, suggested. If there isn't, I mean, the other the creative ways to validate the model could be um, water extent. So you can get water extent from Landsat, Modis. And uh, starting November this year, hopefully, there will be the SWAT mission that will be providing uh, water extent, water elevation, and you can get people working on uh, algorithms to get uh, stream flow from those observations at a finer resolution. Yeah, so I think SWOT will be launched later this year, I believe, right? Yeah, it was supposed to be November, but I think there's a there, there were some issues with the, the scheduling of the launch because of the war in Ukraine. Question 18 is riparian flooding has a slope, unlike rising water flooding in lakes and coastal areas. How can uh, this slope be captured between cross section, like the ones employed in HEC modeling. These models don't assume the water level between these points are flat, right? Um, I think that is true. Um, they're, not, they're not assumed, uh, these models don't assume that they're flat. Um, so we'll have to look into this uh, precise or specific answer to that question, how it is uh, handled. So the, the slope in the model usually comes from the DEM. So uh, if, there's a, if there's a slope in the whatever uh, river you're looking at, that, that will be uh, identified by I mean, that they'll be as accurate in the model as the DEM is. So if, if you have like a, a fine resolution DEM that is also accurate, then that slope will be represented in the model. The next question is, which satellite tool can show almost real-time flooding? Will RSAT provide capacity building using HECRAS and SWAT? How can high map be applied by integrating local information? Thank you. So let me answer the RSET part. Uh, if there is sufficient interest, uh, we will try and do a, a training where we have hands-on experience with uh, either or ECRAS and SWOT. And in the future, we can also think about list high map. Everything is uh, involves a little bit of learning. Uh, so. Um, but so so not in need, I mean, we don't know exactly when, but we can plan that if there is interest. Now, with the question about which satellite tool can show almost real-time flooding. So there is always some latency because by the time satellite data are received and processed, um, but MODIS um, uh, in NASA worldview that we saw, that provides the most near real-time flood information. Uh, you can also uh, use VIRS for that um, application also. Um, so that that's the tool right now. Um, 
uh, near real time. I'm saying there are other SARS uh, like Sentinel-1 and uh, two data are there, uh, but they all are not daily data like MODIS or VIRUS. So that's why um, I think NASA Worldview MODIS flood map is useful for that. Question 20 is, does HiMap give room for embellishment flood vulnerability maps? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that term. Mm. Yeah, I no, I think that uh, once HiMap provides you flood information, then based on other data sets, uh, one can derive uh, vulnerability maps with other infrastructure and socioeconomic data. Yeah, I mean, for uh, um, I was uh, talking about the embellishment. I don't know what the term means. In, uh, embellishment, but vulnerability uh, map, yes. But, uh, yeah, you can get flood, flood vulnerability maps, just like I showed in the case of the Mississippi Delta, in the, the southern Louisiana. So those can be used as uh, flood vulnerability maps. Uh, question 21 is for the high map model and data resources for Pakistan users are usually restricted with satellite data access is high map capable to predict floods before time so that the devastation can be minimized uh, last but not the least how can we start using the model is there any tutorial available with any example run file yeah I think both of these questions were previously answered so you can you can run high map and uh, can perform forecasts. You, you, you need, um, I mean, the model implemented for the domain that you're looking at and meteorological forecasts supports the model. And, uh, and for this, and, and if, if the, the model is being, is run routinely and outputs are provided to you know, uh, decision makers and you know, um, author local authorities, then it can be used uh, to, to inform uh, and minimize uh, damages. Uh, the second question, we talked about it um, before. Uh, so it's on GitHub. The, everything, the tutorials are available there as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, so question 22 is, can one make maps of vulnerable areas in Nigeria that are susceptible to flooding? Because Nigeria is compromising and endangering the lives of citizens in the process of land acquisition. Yeah, again, you, you can uh, have uh, maps of vulnerable areas. Uh, but uh, as again, you have to implement the model for your domain and perform a few simulations with extreme events. And then you have your uh, a map of flooded areas. Yeah, and also I think it's useful to uh, calibrate and validate for your own region before you start making decisions based on that. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, you need a if you can if you can calibrate the model against observations, and then a, a validation will help you identify where you know the model is more or less accurate. Okay. So question 23, is small watersheds respond more directly to individual rain events. Larger basins like Mississippi River are much more complicated and difficult to model using these approaches. At what scales do these models work best? Uh, yeah, that's a scaling issue. Uh, I think uh, there, there shouldn't be, I mean, as, as I showed here, the model is applied from you know, global to uh, city scale. So, so I haven't seen any uh, limitations in terms of uh, you know, scale in the model. So my short question, uh, there isn't a, a, you know, the, the best scale to, to work with these models. Uh, it, it all depends on the, the data availability. I think that the data availability is the, is the main constraint when you're applying such models. Right. Uh, so next question is, does the database cover the Middle East and North Africa region? So let me ask, answer the, the flood monitoring tools we talked about. 
they do cover Middle East and North Africa region. Um, models also can be trained for the, the same region and uh, Augusto can uh, add more to that, but HiMap of course is global, so it can be used for Middle East and North Africa. Question 25 is how can we monitor outburst lakes in glaciers with high map for urban flooding forecasting? Uh, so there's no lake uh, modeling in a, in a high map. That's something that has to be, uh, it's in the list of things to be implemented. Uh, and um, I mean, there will be, so once it's implemented, then will be testing in different cases including glaciers and um, yeah but uh, for now that it, it, the short answer is uh, we cannot for now but uh, in, the, in the near future we will be able to. Okay, next question is which factor are you considering in high map for urban forecasting? Which factor? Uh, I don't know what uh, it, I, I guess right. basically you need um, weather forecasting and that for inputs, right? For high map. Oh yeah, so I, yeah, so you're not forecast, you're not performing forecasts. So you're looking at the near real time. So the, uh, once the model, once the system is transferred, they'll be running the model every 30 minutes mm. using uh, the 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 rainfall monitoring system data so the basically the steps are to grab the observe the precipitation observations uh specialize the the point based observations and then run the model and then the model outputs will be converted into a flood risk a flood risk map and then they will be made available uh to the to end users like online for like in, with a visualization system. So that's the the, ba the basic steps uh, that will be taken every 30 minutes. Good. Question 27 is without LIDAR data, is it possible to forecast urban flood? Any experience of in implementing the model in West Africa to share with us? Okay. Uh, you can use a, a global DEM. It's just that the the, res the spatial resolution won't be sufficient to to get the you know the streets right because uh, you, like you know and also the the accuracy of these global DEMs are pretty coarse. Like the the resolution, the the, the vertical accuracy is in the order of meters. So um, I mean you you have the result. You, you can run the model. The model can be run, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't trust the results. And then experience of implementing the model in West Africa. Yeah, so there's a paper. Um, I can I, I can share the the link and put in the I can share in the uh, in the chat and then the link can be added to the the answer to question twenty seven. Yes, yes. So if we can put that in chat. Mm -hmm. Um, question 28, what magnitude degree of flooding are we talking about here? I mean in terms of land coverage, source of flooding, etc. that can be mapped. The what magnitude degree of flooding? Here where? Um, so degree of flooding what magnitude in terms of land coverage, source of floods, etc. I think uh, uh, this question also needs a little more clarification. Uh, is it about flood intensity? What do you mean by magnitude? Um, degree of flooding, so not sure. Uh, if you can clarify a little more. Question 29 is, since floods are an extreme event, 
the pixels representing flood on land are usually small compared to non-flood pixels. I was wondering how this imbalance classification dealt with flood modeling at NASA. I believe some used SMART, borderline SMART, et cetera. Could you please shed some more light on it? So um, this is more to do with satellite pixels. That's what you're asking that if um, pixel represents flood on land are usually small compared to non-flood pixels. So uh, pixels, if you are if you are saying that sub pixel at sub pixel level, if there is flooding and not not anywhere else, then I think that, that statistically that can that has been done. I don't think operationally it is done. This is, for example, MODIS has 250 or 500 meter pixel. Part of it could be flooded and part of it not. Um, I don't think it's easy to distinguish uh, just by looking at uh, the pixel data. There are, other, there, there are statistical methods used with additional information, but um, we do not have a lot of details here. We can look for the information. If, if we can find, we can try and provide. So question 30 is from a modeling perspective, can I give a relative weight to the risk factors of flood based on their actual contribution to flood risk? Since not all factors are not equal contributors to risk, certain factors may be more important than others. Uh, okay, that's not as clear, hold on. Yeah, so I, I think in general that's true, not all factors have the same risk. So that assessment um, is necessary for your own region. So factors of flood based on their actual contribution to flood risk, relative weight to the risk factors. But, but yes, that is true. It, uh, there are multiple factors that can be responsible uh, and they all can have different weights depending on, on the situation and, and the area you are working with. Yeah, I think a way to, to um, quantify the the way to the risk factors is performing different experiments uh, like the ones that I performed over the over southern Louisiana uh, so you can perform those what if scenarios uh, with and without a particular factor of interest and then like you like looking at these two simulations with and without you can determine the uh, how important that factor is for the flood risk. Question 31 is, in a large watershed, which would not respond to individual rain events, isn't base flow a more important component of to total flow? How do these models perform with respect to base flow prediction? Yeah, base flow, um, yeah, th th that's true that some in some locations, some basins, base flow uh, is more important. I wouldn't say that uh, base flow is a is a ma major factor for a flood event. That in that case, for a flood event, uh, surface runoff is a, a more important component. Uh, but base flow is derived from uh, land models. So as I as I mentioned before, high map is forced with uh, surface runoff and base flow simulated by land surface models. Uh, so depending on the model they're using, uh, the, the distribution between base flow and surface runoff would be different. This question, next question is, so do they use the input from the wastewater treatment plant outflows as well because it can be a huge amount in certain basin areas no the the kind of uh the kind of water use is not uh accounted for in our modeling system that that's um yeah that that's a more more like a, a local scale 
so I believe that's what, and I will check whether West, um, wastewater outflow is included, but there it's likely that it is included in SWOT kind of model, but we'll confirm that. Yeah, whatever model you're using, that, that's the kind of information that we have to provide to the model. The model, that's not a natural process, so you have to, any human intervention have, has to be Yeah, used. model. To have the you know the the operations of the the treatment plant. Next question is: Is HiMap soft software free to download and use? If so, I look forward to download it for flood modeling in my flood-stricken country, South Sudan. Yes, so I, I, Augusto, you can talk about it. We just showed the website from where you can uh, download the software. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about this before. Yeah. Question 34. Uh, you provided a slide with median event and annual event and looked at cropland flood risk and population flood risk. How are you defining median events? Uh, the median event is. Uh the the flood extent that uh, is above 50 percent of the time the it occurs uh, more than half of the time while the the annual events the event that occurs once a year okay great i think um, um if you have if you still have questions, we can address them. We have a little more time. Um, at this point, I do want to point out one thing. Um, previously, I mentioned that the homework is available online right now, but it looks like it will be available by the end of today. So right now, you may not find the homework online on our set website, but it will be posted uh, by the end of today. So then you can download, or it will be a Google form. So next question is what kind of computational resources are required to run high map simulation? Is it cloud-based? Can we mask areas outside the area of interest while running um, at global scale to optimize computation? Uh, it's not cloud-based. Uh, I mean, th there's some efforts to put uh, lists in the in the cloud, uh, but uh, for now, like you can you can run in your personal computer, but uh, it may take uh, much longer uh, than I mean. Here at NASA, we use a supercomputer. I mean, of course, that not not everybody here has access to it, but uh, to a like a supercomputer. So yeah, I mean. Uh, Technically, you can run it in any computer. It's just that uh, this is a is a is a heavy uh, modeling framework that is supposed to you know it, because of all this all the uh, the capabilities. It may take more memory and you know than other models. But so it's a, it's a more appropriate if you're looking at you know data simulation and the, there's several features in and capabilities in LIS that are not available in other modeling systems. But um, yeah, a, a short answer, you can you can run uh, in a computer. And can we mask? Yeah, you, you can, uh, yeah, there's an option where you can you define your domain and then you provide a mask, or you just provide the, 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 the your rectangle, the, 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 the window that you're looking at, and then you remove the the parameters um, outside the mask that you're not interested in, so you can optimize the computation. Okay, great. Uh, is the high map working like SWOT? Um, uh, I, I think SWOT has uh, other features that high map doesn't. For example, water quality. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's some uh, water use as a, as uh, you mentioned before, 
the like for example the the, the treatment plant mm -hmm. that is not included in high map i think the so there there is some uh advantage i, I i'm not like an expert on on swat but uh the main advantage of high map uh i mean one of the advantages of high map is for, for being in leads you have uh the the possibility to run to run it with a uh, different land surface models and perform data simulation um yeah and then i don't think you can do that with swat yes that's true so next question is can we run this model on google earth engine uh not yet no so we did see hijack floods which is observational based that is on um, google earth engine but high map not yet it, you know so other models are also uh, they're not available on google earth engine that we talked about few years ago i saw flood mapping using snap now i am seeing high map what is the difference between two snap is also applicable so snap is really the sentinel one it analyzes sentinel data sar data so it's specifically uh, you can look at flood based on synthetic aperture radar data snap tool allows you to process the data and uh classify areas as flood and non-flood etc so that is very different from high map high map is a, a flood routing model that works with land surface model um you know in which satellite data are used but it's snap is not a model it, it's a tool that uses observations and how to to classify flooded area based on observations from sar Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, there are no more questions. Or if there are questions, we still have a few minutes. But we really want to thank our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Augusto Jetirana, today. Um, he, you know, from his busy schedule, he has taken time to uh, do his presentation and also be here for this question answer session. So thank you, Augusto, very much for this. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. Thank you for the, the opportunity and. Um... Yeah, I hope that uh, it was useful for all the listeners here. Yes, I think people, you might, um, your email address has been given so people might contact you if they have more questions or if they, as you said in your slide, collaborations are also welcome, right? So Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be glad to answer the. Right, right. So we also want to thank our guest speaker from previous session, Caroline Williams. She presented Hydra Floods. I'm sorry. Or you no, to me? fine. So uh, there are no questions. If there are we, wow. we have a few more minutes. And again, I want to remind that homework will be posted by the end of today. It will be on the RSET website. Oh, we have one more question. Is high map relevant in countries such as Uganda, where the only floods in Uganda are from the seasonal rains? Yeah, the high map can be used in anywhere. Um, but uh, the relevant the relevance will be based on uh, the data that you're like the, the inputs that you're using. So if you if you have good precipitation data, um, then the outputs will be relevant. You can make decisions based on on the high map outputs. But if you if you don't have good um, data to inform the model, so then I mean. You can that it won't be as useful, right? Or useful won't be as useful at all. So the relevance is uh, heavily based on the data, the input data that you're using.
So thank you for attending uh, this uh, flood monitoring and modeling webinar. Uh, just wanted to remind you that uh, homework will be due on 7th of October and will be available by the end of today on our set website. Um, also, you will receive a survey uh, at the end uh, by the end of this um, at the end of the series. So that today it's the concluding session. So you will receive a survey about this webinar, and we request you to uh, go through the survey and provide us feedback about this training and how we can improve. It's very important to us. So in the survey, there are also topics that uh, you might choose you want for future training. Um, you also have a place you can provide comments about your interests. Uh, so please do take a few minutes to complete the survey when you receive it. I also want to thank the RSET team for their help here uh, with planning and organizing this webinar. I want to thank my colleague, Sean McCartney, uh, Selvin hudson Odoy, uh, Sarah Kutchell, uh, Brock Blevins, and Jonathan O'Brien. Uh, all of them have been greatly helpful in organizing this webinar. And of course, our guest speakers, uh, Gusto Jatirana and Caroline Williams, we thank them both for their time and effort. Augusto, thank you for your time. Oh, there is one more question. Is it possible to install LIS or HiMap to install on Windows system or Conda environment? Uh, you, you need a, a virtual machine, uh, a Linux, Linux virtual machine, if, you're, if your operating system is Windows. Okay, so uh, the homework assignment now is on the website, so you should be able to access it. If there are no more questions, we really want to thank you all for attending this webinar series, and we look forward to see you in our future trainings. Thank you.